Good evening to you all. This is a, a very warm welcome to you. My name is Jennifer Davidson. I'm the Professor of Practice and the Executive Director of the Institute for Inspiring Children's Futures here at Strathclyde. And on behalf of the University of Strathclyde, I'm just delighted to invite you to uh, welcome you to the 18th Phil Brandon Lecture. And I think probably like you, if you had been around last year at the Kilbrandon Lecture, if you uh, told me that I'd be chairing this event from my home and that you'd be at home maybe eating your dinner while you're listening to the lecture or maybe with your slippered feet up, I would never have believed you. But um, if we've learned anything, I think, from this crazy and very taxing year, it's the importance of maintaining some routines in our lives. And so it seems very fitting that as we do every uh, year, that we are yet again gathering for what will be a stimulating and thought-provoking Kilbrandon Lecture. And we're really glad that you've taken time to join us today despite these um, unprecedented times. Um, so a very warm welcome to you. I invite you to sit back and to relax. And I'd like to ask Sir Jim McDonald, the university principal, to formally open the evening and to introduce this year's esteemed speaker, Madeline Bunting. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, and good evening, Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to the 18th Co-Brandon Lecture. Uh, and I'm also delighted to welcome the almost 400 participants in this evening's lecture. Uh, of course, if we'd been at the Barony Hall, it would have been standing room only. So uh, in many ways, we've, uh, under the challenging circumstances, we've managed to engage even more to participate in tonight's lecture. First of all, uh, I'm delighted that we're able to welcome the distinguished writer and broadcaster Madeline Bunting to the University of Strathclyde, albeit virtually. Uh, and I very much look forward to hearing Madeline's contribution to this long established lecture series. I'd also like to provide a little bit of background to the Cobrandon lecture and also to offer a few specific welcomes. There have been many distinguished lecturers since this series was inaugurated, and this has included Donald Dewar, the first minister of our Scottish Parliament, and more recently, Nicola Sturgeon, our first minister. Sir Harry Burns, Scotland's former chief medical officer and now professor of global public health here at Strathclyde. Professor Alexis Jay, who is an honorary professor at Strathclyde and chair of our Centre of Excellence for Looked After Children, and who continues to chair the independent inquiry into child abuse in England and Wales. We also had Professor Kathleen Marshall, who is an honorary professor at Strathclyde and Scotland's first children's commissioner and chair of our Institute for Inspiring Children's Futures, who I'm pleased to say is also with us this evening. And last year, we had the opportunity to hear from Professor Manfred Novak, who led the United Nations Global Study of Children Deprived of Liberty. As many of you will already know, the committee, which Lord Brandon established in 1960, led to the formation of Scotland's unique and globally respected approach to care and justice for young people, the children's hearing system. And the hearing system is designed to ensure that children's needs, as well as their deeds, are considered whenever legal proceedings relating to care and justice concerning children arise. Since its inception, the system has contributed immensely to the care of children and to greater respect for their rights and their futures. The Cobrandon Lecture Series is a joint venture between the Scottish Government and the University of Strathclyde. The lecture, which was initiated by the University of Glasgow's Ch Centre for the Child and Society, is now hosted by Strathclyde School of Social Work and Social Policy. And I'm delighted that Malcolm Hill, Professor Emeritus at Strathclyde, who worked alongside Professor Stuart Asquith, who founded the Cobrandon Lecture Series in 1991 is also able to join us this evening. The lecture continues to enjoy the support of Lord Cobrandon's family, and tonight they are represented by Miss Heather Shaw, Lord Cobrandon's granddaughter, and Heather is also a solicitor with an interest in family law. I'm pleased that uh, Jennifer Davidson, our Executive Director of the Institute for Inspiring Children's Futures, has also agreed to chair the lecture. And it's a privilege to have us with us, with us all this evening. Paul Johnson, Director General of Communities with Scottish Government. Uh, Iona Colvin, uh, Chief Social Worker to the Scottish Government. And I'm also pleased to welcome Michael Chalmers, Director of Children and Families with Scottish Government. And Elliot Jackson, Chief Executive Officer of Children's Hearings Scotland. 
We also have with us Bruce Adamson, Scotland's Children's Commissioner, Derek Feely, who has led the independent review of adult social care in Scotland, and Alison Gordon, President of Social Work Scotland. We are joined too by representatives from local government and the voluntary sector, the Scottish Government and academic colleagues from across Scotland. And I'm also delighted to have in tonight's audience individuals actively engaged in the lives of children and young people in Scotland, panel members, social workers, healthcare workers, teachers, members of the legal profession, and very importantly, students and young people, some of whom are themselves care experienced. You're all very welcome indeed. So Lord Colbrandon's legacy, our unique children's hearing system, touches all of the professions and services that interact with Scotland's young people. For this reason, this lecture series considers the vast range of issues that can impact on a child's upbringing and explores how, together, we can make Scotland the best place to grow up. This lecture is now an important part of the university's annual events calendar. And to my own university, the University of Strathclyde was founded as Anderson's Institution in 1796 during the Scottish Enlightenment, and we were established to be a place of useful learning. And I believe our founder, John Anderson, would recognise the importance in particular of this event this evening. The instructions in John Anderson's will asked that this institution was also a place open to everyone, regardless of gender, status or income values that you will recognise as being in keeping with the ethos of the Colbrandon Report. So it's with that in mind, I'm pleased to let you know that the School of Social Work and Social Policy, with the support of Erin Lux, a university PhD scholar and staff member within Inspiring Children's Futures, has revised and relaunched the Colbrandon website, which now hosts each of the lectures that have been presented over the past 30 years, a real repository of excellence. So now let me introduce our speaker. Madeline Bunting is a journalist and author and honorary fellow of the University of Cardiff. She read history at Cambridge University and studied politics at Harvard University. She was formerly an associate editor and columnist at the Guardian newspaper and has written five works of nonfiction and two novels. Madeline is a regular broadcaster for the BBC. Her most recent series of essays for Radio 3 was on the idea of home and were broadcast in March 2020. Her published works include a study of the German occupation of the Channel Islands during the Second World War. In 2004, she published an account of the role of overworking, including the misuse of zero-hour uh, zero contracts in British life. She has a deep affinity with Scotland, which is very clearly conveyed in her book, Love of Country, A Hebridean Journey, published in 2016. And she has won awards for her writing on global inequality and international development. Closer to home, she's been recognized by the Commission for Racial Equality for drawing new voices into the media from the British Muslim community. And her latest book, Labors of Love, The Crisis of Care, addresses the most important issue of our time, care, how it is provided, organized, and paid for, and most importantly, what care is. The pandemic that we're all experiencing has, of course, served to highlight the importance of care and the importance of the human connections that we share and so often take for granted. The ideas set out in our work are of relevance to policymakers, to health and social work professionals, academics, and the public at large. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am truly delighted that we can now invite Madeline Bunting to deliver the 18th Co-Brandon Lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely warm welcome. I can't tell you how honoured I am to be here and to be speaking to you for several reasons. One, as Jim mentioned, I have a very, very great fondness for Scotland uh, and so regret not being with you in person and that we are doing this by Zoom when it would have been such a wonderful occasion, but still we press on and I am very honoured that I'm walking in the footsteps of so many of your past lecturers in the Kilbrandon, Kilbrandon series who have been a personal great inspiration to me. And I include people like Guy Standing, Frank, Frank Cottrell Boyce, Harry Burns, and most recently I've been looking at the work of Dame Ale Alexis Jay. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm honoured. Uh, and I have to also add that it gives me great satisfaction to be following Donald Dewar, because as a very young cub reporter, aged 24, I turned up in Glasgow to do some research and bless him, Donald Dewar took me seriously. <laughs> I probably didn't have a clue what I was asking him about, but he was patient and graceful. I'm also honored because I think Kilbrandon uh, did something really rather remarkable, which is as a writer, I'm really, really interested in because he managed to uh, make redundant a word. Now, I'm somebody who spends a lot of time thinking about words. When I was a teenager and a child, the word delinquent was commonly used of troublesome teenage boys, largely boys. And it's interesting that my children wouldn't ever use that term. They wouldn't even know what I meant by it. Delinquent is not a term now used. And I think in many parts, many ways Kilbrandon played a key role in shifting the focus uh, from deeds to needs and putting out that word uh, to pasture. So I'm going to take another word tonight and I want to take uh, you through various uh, questions and investigations that took me uh, the best part of four years around the word care. It's such a short word, it's only four letters uh, and yet if you begin to think about it, it covers such an enormous range of human activities and is threaded into so many different forms of relationship. So in some contexts, it's professionalized. In others, it's industrialized. We talk about the care industry. It gets commodified. Uh, and yet it's also absolutely part and parcel of our most important intimate relationships. We provide care for our partners, our parents, our children. Uh, and so it is deeply personal. So I describe care really as a, as a form of empire because it is so vast and because it has so many multiple meanings uh, and is used in so many ways. But the curious thing about this empire is that it is often overlooked. It is often misunderstood or not understood at all. And so I would say, if people ask me, what, what was the purpose of your book? What is the, the, the kind of overarching aim of what you were trying to do in your four years of research? I would say it's this, and it's really quite small, quite simple. I want to provoke curiosity into what care really is. A word that we bandy about all the time, it's ubiquitous. It's become sort of hollow of real substance because we're using it so often. Take care, we say, take care. It's become a form of goodbye. But actually, when you drill down into what exactly happens when one person is providing care for another, when someone is receiving care, what are they receiving? And it's that complexity that I just think is the most important thing, that if we can shift across society, cross-cultural, curiosity into care. And one of the things that I think makes it so deceptively complex is that it straddles so many dualist, dualisms. It's both ethical and practical. Who do I care about? Who do I care for? And very practical, how do I care? So it, it's about an emotion, the sense of empathy, empathy or connection of resonance between people but it's also absolutely about actions, lots of very important small actions. It's both creative and routine. We all know occasions when we have responsibilities for somebody which constitute care, which have become tedious uh, and exhausting and a, and a draining experience. And similarly, we've had experiences where it's almost like an epiphany. It's this sudden moment where there's a shift and that moment of care becomes profoundly meaningful. And our understanding of who we are as human beings, how we relate to another human being is suddenly evident. It's also scientific. A nurse providing care is drawing from a great reserve of scientific knowledge. I shadowed GPs and I was constantly aware of how they were relating this huge body of training and expertise to the person that was in front of them. 
So there was an, a, a personal relational element and also this scientific knowledge. So I think care, because of its complexity, gets organized in very different ways. It gets understood in very different ways. And we don't normally connect the intimate personal care of a partner or a parent and child as being essentially sharing many characteristics with the professional care, perhaps of a nurse or a GP or a social care worker. And it was uh, a great interest of mine to find those commonalities right across all sorts of different forms of care. But first, let me just briefly start a word on timing. I started researching this project in 2015 for, in fact, a BBC radio series, uh, a series of essays that I wrote for Radio 3. And over the following four years, people would ask me, what are you working on? And I would explain. And there eyebrows would go up slightly puzzled because of course my previous book had been about the Hebrides so they were thinking well this is a bit of a jump into a new direction Madeline and then they were like don't you find it depressing and I'd be like sorry uh, and they made a number of very quick leaps they leapt from care to the elderly instantly so everyone assumed I was writing about the elderly uh, which was took me back completely because that was not the intention of my book at all. Uh, although, of course, that's an important dimension to it. And then they said, but it's a bit boring, isn't it? And it was, it was that response that uh, I encountered frequently. And I'll be really honest, hand on heart, I'll say that I began to doubt myself. What am I doing? Why am I spending four years on a subject that so many people find boring? Am I even going to find any readers? Uh, and I think what I will try and show in the course of this lecture is that there is a cultural undervaluing of care, which is so extensive, so pervasive, and in many respects so subtle that we are all involved and, and compromised by it. We are all caught in a value system which does not actually accord care the significance that it rightly deserves. Now, that was my position four years ago and, and over the following few years. In April 2020, I'm putting the final proofs to bed on the book. And of course, everything has been upended and I'm standing on my doorstep clapping for carers with a cacophony of noise in East London, as you can imagine, trumpets, horns, everything. We were all banging saucepans. It was fireworks going off in the street. And I just was completely astonished that our value system could be so dramatically turned upside down and people could be recognizing that actually they were totally dependent at that moment on the undervalued work of hundreds of thousands of, of carers and key workers. Was this the beginning of a new era? Was this the paradigm shift that I was calling for in the book? Or was this some brief emotional moment that might just pass. We'll come on to that. So I'm delighted really to be speaking in Scotland at this particular moment, but because in the middle of a pandemic, I think we've been thinking very, very deeply about care. I think the, the recent review into the adult social care in Scotland was fascinating. And when Derek Feely, the chair rightly said, if not now, when? I couldn't agree with him more, I'm punching the air. And then he also said, we need a new narrative. We need to shift the paradigm. And I also couldn't agree with him more. And that is what my book is all about. Because the crisis of care is not just about budgets and financing and demographics about an aging population. Those are all the buckets that care gets stuffed into. It's something far, far more profound, which goes to this point that I'm making about a, a structural, systemic undervaluing of care across our culture. The subtitle of my book is The Crisis of Care. And as a journalist and commentator on The Guardian, I had, of course, been writing about the crises of care, with multiple crises of care, continually. And 
to just briefly remind you, I want to make sure that we have this landscape in front of us to remind you, endemic low pay. I have various figures in front of me and each of them still shocks me when I look back at them. 40% of childcare staff are underpaid. The Low Pay Commission describes this sector as by far the worst problem for low pay. And social care workers, many of whom on contracts that don't give them a proper wage. Something like 220,000 are believed to be affected by low pay. But what this leads to is persistent retention and recruitment problems across the care sector. And enormous resources going into this constant churn, which so badly compromises quality. And that's true in even relatively well paid as uh, areas of the, 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 care, um, the care workforce, such as nurses, but is obviously particularly problematic in places like childcare and social care. And then I'm curious, I was, I've been curious about how the problems associated with care move into better paid, high status forms of care work, care professions, where there's a constant concern about burnout, stress, care professionals such as GPs talking of heavy workloads, standardization, the audit culture, a form of work intensification, which has provoked a recruitment crisis in GPs. And, and then of course the care home sector, deeply precarious long before COVID, uneven provision, areas of the country where there are too few places, the loading of debt onto private care home chains, such that they risk going under, some indeed have done so, and domiciliary care stripped to a minimum. Inhumane 15 minute visits, no pay for travel time, and the tightening criteria, which have seen something like one and a half million elderly people who once would have received support at home, no longer do, a skeletal system. And then this bizarre phenomenon, which we're all familiar with, a sort of repetitive cycle of commissions and inquiries and, and outrage and rhetoric from politicians, this has got to be tackled, that the, the, the care particularly of the elderly needs to be addressed and repeatedly nothing results, nothing effective results. We limp on to the next commission, the next inquiry. And then under austerity, certain aspects of care have been hollowed out in a way that is chilling. So the number, for example, just to give you a, a specific example, the number of disability nurses, such a key expertise, dropped by 41% in seven years between 2009 and 2016, a shocking statistic. And equally troubling is the, the decline in mental health nurses of 10% at a time of soaring need. So one of my objectives really, when I set out to write a book about, about this subject was to try and understand why I'd been writing about this for 20 years, these repeated crises. What was the bigger framing that would perhaps explain why we seemed to be constantly lurching from crisis to crisis. Uh, and that's why I decided that I would crisscross the country, length and breadth, north, south, east, west. I would shadow care professionals, people working in care. I would interview carers in all kinds of different contexts, charity workers, nurses, doctors, go on to wards, sit at the back of GP surgeries, go into care homes, talk to people doing, uh, working in palliative care in hospital, hospices and hospitals. And I decided I wanted to hear what they had to say. What was their explanation? What did they understand by this short four letter word care? And it was fascinating. Again and again, I would sit down with somebody in an interview um, a healthcare assistant or a social care worker and they would be very awkward and they would say to me I really don't think I've got anything to tell you I, I, I don't know what to say you know I do my job that's all and I would say well perhaps I could just ask you a few questions and uh, I'm sure I'm sure we'll find something to talk about and slowly the hesitancy and the shyness would wear off 
And an hour later, we'd still be chatting and there'd be still more to say. And then there were these extraordinary moments when a, a care worker turned to me, a social care worker turned to me and she said, I had no idea of all the things I've just said. And it was one of those wonderful moments because you could see the pride in her as she got up and left for the interview. And what was so moving for me and so humbling for me was the number of people that said to me at the end of the interview, thank you for listening. And I was like, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you because you, you've been so extraordinary as an interviewee. But there was some process of affirmation going on that I wasn't fully aware of, that one person explicitly said it to me. She'd worked in, uh, in, in home care, a very luxury end of home care, where she'd gone to live in people's houses. And I listened to her describe those experiences. And then she emailed me afterwards and she said, thank you so much for listening. You're the first person who's asked me about it and listened to what I, uh, my experiences have been. And it has just been so powerful to be affirmed in that way. So then I got to thinking, well, what is all this about? What, what is it that, that, the, that people are not feeling comfortable to talk about? That, that one care worker said to me, I don't really like confessing what I do. At the school gates, people look down on me when I say I'm a social care worker. And I realized that there was a sense of shame she was carrying, that this is not high status work. It, it's not valued. One very uh, feisty 21 year old, uh, wonderful character with long braids and, and lots of piercings and tattoos and a, and a wonderful warm heart. She said to me, I don't care if my friends think my job's rubbish and it's wiping bums because I know it is so much more. I know that I make a difference to people's day. And when they are just trimming nails or sorting out suntans in a beauty parlor, they're not making someone's day. I am. And I loved her sort of attitude, but it was true even of a couple of friends of mine who had done care work in their twenties. Both of them had several degrees each. And they said to me, no one has ever asked about that chapter of my life. This was two separate friends, different ends of the country. They didn't know each other, but both of them shared the same thing. They had worked very hard, one in a care home and the other as a healthcare assistant in a hospital. And they said nobody had shown any interest in the work uh, and they'd never had an opportunity to talk about it before, despite them both acknowledging that it had had a profound impact on their lives, that it had given them a perspective on what it is to be human that they had deeply valued. So I felt as if there was some sort of invisibility that masks so much of care and that silences so many of the experiences of care. And indeed, that was an issue that I came back to again and again in the course of the book, the way in which care as an activity, as a relationship, as a labor, as an ethical imperative, in all these ways, it gets edged out of the conversation. It's a subtle form of silencing. And I think there's so much wider kind of fear about our frailty as human beings, about our dependence ultimately at the vulnerable moments of our lives, but particularly when we're sick or ill or dying or elderly. Uh, and it's almost as if we want to keep such experiences uh, at arm's length. I think there's a deep cultural aversion to, to, to the, the reality of our lives, which is our dependence at key moments. We will be dependent on the kindness of strangers. And as that's so, surely we all owe it to ourselves and to each other that whatever cultural resources we can mobilize to sustain that kindness of strangers is critical. And I think the pandemic has really helped make that point to us. So I came up with a working definition of care and I propose in the book some ways of thinking about what, what care is in its commonalities right across the board and how it then gets interpreted in very different ways. And I started with, with three foundational uh, elements, if you like. Uh, and the first is presence. 
the second attention and the third touch. Now I found the literature on care within the nursing discipline, one of the most rich and fascinating. And I think that nurse, nursing and in particular, uh, Anne-Marie Rafferty, uh, Scott herself, uh, who is the current president of the Royal College of Nursing, told me, Madeline, care is dark matter. It's everywhere, and yet we still can't quite pin it down. There's something that's so elusive and difficult to define about it. But one of the quotes that is often used in nursing literature is the quote by Simone Weil, the French philosopher, that the purest form of generosity is attention, to give someone your attention. And I was very struck by this when I was interviewing the mother of a, a child with disabilities, who said to me that when her daughter was in intensive care, she could recognize the person and the quality of their care by the way they opened and shut the door and moved across the room. We communicate through every part of our body language, particularly at acute moments of vulnerability. And speaking for myself, I, I, I recognize this immediately. When I was in labor and the midwife was giving me so much emotional support, I held her hand so tightly, please, please come back from your break as fast as possible. <laughs> and my gratitude to her was enormous. And that's the curious thing that any carer will tell you is they get so much back from their gestures of care. So many nurses and doctors and care workers said, this is a reciprocal relationship. I get so much back from those I care for. Their gratitude, their affirmation of the value of my labor. So going back to this working definition, I found the work of an American philosopher, Morris Hamilton, very, very beautiful. He has thought and written a lot about care and he has a wonderful article in which he talks about his, his thinking about care through the experience of washing his daughter's hair. And he talks about how so much of our experience of care starts with an experience of touch as small children, as babies. And in the touching, care becomes an embodied knowledge of tenderness and empathy. And also he describes humor, that as he's washing his daughter's hair, they chat, they giggle, they share jokes. And at all times, she's feeling his tenderness, his attentiveness. Don't get water in her eyes. Any child, any parent who's ever washed their children's hair knows you have to be very careful not to get any soap in the eyes, otherwise it all falls apart. So care is like a muscle memory. We remember it. And of course, our last moments in life will similarly be about touch. I, I held my father's hand. He'd been in a coma for two weeks, but the nurses said to me, hold his hand. And I have to trust that perhaps something in that touch reached him as he slipped away. So to just emphasize this aspect of the relationality, because I think it's been deeply problematic that it gets lost, it gets neglected, it gets forgotten. One of the things that really alarms me is how often when you're talking to care, people working in the, in the care sector, how often they use the word delivery. Uh, I hope my audience doesn't include anybody that uh, uses that word in speeches, but I suspect you may do. Uh, I've heard a lot of um, people talking about the delivery of care packages. Uh, it sounds like an Amazon parcel. Uh, and I think it's really, really misleading, dangerously so, because it indicates the ways in which a the values of a consumer culture have been infiltrated into care. The point about delivery 
as all of us are discovering in lockdown, the parcels that arrive on our doorstep, we say thank you to the delivery man if we have a chance, but usually he's heading down the garden path before we've even had a chance to say that. It's a very short one-off interaction, if that at all. It's a transaction. transaction. But the point about so much of care is it's not discreet, it's not packaged, it's unpredictable, and it's extremely hard to work out where it stops and starts, or indeed what its constituent elements will be at any one time. The care worker who turns up in a home to maybe wash or feed somebody with dementia uh, will, may well struggle to leave on time as the elderly person may drop their cup of tea, may struggle that particular morning getting dressed, slip in the shower, any number of things. We know how care can often suddenly, something happens, we didn't expect it. So there's a flexibility that needs to be built into the system. You can't turn care into a sort of tailorized production line. That's what a, another professor of nursing was passionate about. You can't do the breaking up of the process that, that, that the, the management theory of Taylor proposed and apply that to the tasks of care, which has been done repeatedly. Uh, and those type of market models of competition and, and, and productivity imported into care can be disastrous. One of the ways in which they're disastrous, which I thought was particularly interesting in my research, a very, very interesting psychologist Paqueta du Zuleta at Imperial College produced a paper looking how the neuroscience shows us that our brains work either in competitive mode or in compassionate mode. So in competitive mode, it triggers the fight flight responses, but those will crowd out our, our capacity for compassion. It's either one or the other. It's very hard to do both at the same time. So introduce competitive pressures into care environments, such as targets, such as trying to meet uh, financial disciplines, uh, and the result will be uh, an, uh, a decline in care, uh, a, a, an, an obscuring of it. It's, it, it sort of fades out uh, from the picture. And I think that's what happened in the Mid-Staffordshire uh, Foundation Trust uh, crisis in the 2000s when the inquiry found a catalogue of catastrophic quality of care, uh, tragically so. Uh, and efficiency and productivity had uh, the emphasis on the bottom line had in meant that basic patient care, the dignity and respect for patients ha had been uh, uh, ignored. I was very interested by one person who pointed out to me that there are two areas of human endeavor in which efficiency cannot be the priority. It plays a role, but it cannot be the priority. And that's war and care. And actually we've discovered exactly that in the pandemic. Huge amounts of money have had to be spent. We can't qu uh, quibble about who needs a test. Uh, we have to ensure uh, that, that the tests are there. So perhaps we're learning some of, some of that, but there's a long way to go. When I was shadowing uh, a ward in a hospital, uh, every morning when I went through the, the main entrance to the hospital, there was a massive advert beside the main entrance uh, for a care services company. Care the way you want it, where you want it. And sure enough, there was a picture of a smiling, very pretty elderly lady uh, with a very sm smiley care assistant and a bunch of flowers. Uh, now, care the way you want it, where you want it. Care is not about consumer sovereignty, uh, this kind of uh, principle of the, of the consumer society. It doesn't, uh, it, it, it cannot fit easily with priorities of convenience and speed. So the GPs who said to me that the priority to ensure uh, seven day surgeries was entirely misplaced in their view. It, it compromised their ability to provide con continuity of care, which they believed was absolutely essential to the care provided by a GP. And another part of the definition of care, which I think gets obscured, and 
it's really important, is that there is a part of care which is always a gift, a gift of self. And I have recently got very interested in the way we talk about vocation, often in the context of medicine or uh, healthcare, people will talk about a vocation and a sense that their commitment and dedication to their work is such that they go beyond the call of duty. But we wouldn't so often probably talk about vocation in terms of a social care worker. And I wonder why not? Because they are often just as dedicated, just as prepared to go beyond the call of duty. Uh, and they understand their giving of themselves. When I shadowed healthcare assistants on a ward, the, the healthcare assistants were absolutely had me amazed, to be frank. Their sense of humor, their sense of how they brought their own personality into every day, uh, every minute of their day. The jokes, the humoring, lots of humoring, elderly, confused, um, uh, uh, disorientated patients, how they would coax them into eating, how they might suggest washing uh, and getting dressed, uh, and how they managed to do this with a sort of lightness of touch so that nobody was quite aware of what they were doing. Uh, again and again, I noticed this. A, a nurse practitioner did the same thing in a GP surgery. In the general chat about where are you going uh, on your holidays this year, and I've just come back from my holiday, there was a process of observation of the patient going on, which was deeply skilled, uh, a kind of um, humanity, but also a pro being prepared to bring yourself to work. So I felt that given the complexity, given the significance of this form of work, why on earth is it so disregarded, so marginalized? And that took me into the rich body of theory uh, uh, and feminist economics and feminist philosophy that has accumulated in the last 30 years. The work of people like Joan Tronto, Nancy Fulber, Virginia Held have pioneered an, a fabulous challenge to 300 years of intellectual tradition. Who cooked Adam Smith's dinner? And why don't we know? That was the witty title of a Swedish journalist's book. It was his mother, and he couldn't have written his magnificent works without the support and care of his mother. What troubles me is that this considerable and deeply inspiring body of academic work, and I draw on it extensively in my book, seems to have failed to shift the political and economic assumptions in the public sphere. In public debate, these academics have not made much headway, to be honest. And what persists is a cultural value system in which care must be free or cheap. That is how it's been structured under industrialization. Indeed, Nancy, Nancy Fulber says, patriarchy was designed to make care cheap or free. So we're looking at a massive cultural edifice, if you like, and how do we challenge that? How do we help these academics with their pioneering work really begin to punch through into the public debate? Now, I'm describing a long running invisible crisis there of perception, but I think what's bringing this to a head and was doing so before the pandemic is where three trends are now colliding. One is a rise in the need for care as, it's, as the population ages, but also the unresolved issue of childcare. We've done it on the cheap and we have now unprecedented levels of female employment. Household incomes rely on two incomes and yet we've never worked out what does childcare, quality, well-funded childcare really look like? The UK has dragged its feet for decades. The social trend whereby more and more women have gone into the labour market since the 1980s means that patriarchy's solution to care, largely free, done by women, is no longer possible. 
So women in their 50s and 60s, which is a peak moment for the demands for care, they are often now looking after elderly parents and still looking after young adults. And yet they're already, they are themselves in work. You no longer have an, an army of available women to cope with neighbors in crisis or elderly aunts or relatives. If you look at novels of the 20th century, the role of, of, a, of a woman once she'd raised her own children was to largely look after the extended members of the family in one way or another, or, the, or, or members of the community. That's no longer an option. And yet we haven't thought through the implications of that. There are a number of ways of thinking about the future, and I will just draw very briefly attention to a couple of them as I come to the end of my lecture. I think we're at a, 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 a turning point. We can go in several different directions at this, at this moment in, in history. Interestingly, Japan with its aging population has decided the future is probably robots and an investment in technology. And there's a lot to be said for technology. I don't want to be caught in, in some Luddite type uh, refusal of the role of technology. It, clearly has a role. It, it's fascinating how AI is, is providing incredibly accurate diagnostic techniques, but will this really make the GP or the doctor redundant? No, I would firmly argue we will still need relationship. But some say, no, we can sort all this out with more and more technology, robots in care homes, more and more remote surveillance of the elderly in their homes, more and more tech aids in environments built to support the elderly. That's one future, but I'm going to suggest there's another future. That, and I've got an interesting ally. The chief economist of the Bank of, in, of England gave a very, very interesting speech a year or so ago, and he turns out he's a surprising ally because what he said is with the automation, great swathes of employment, are going to be made redundant. But care is a growing employment sector that cannot be automated. It's too un unpredictable. It requires too much flexibility and too much human judgment. And care will continue to grow. The demand for care in multiple ways will continue to grow. It's a worthwhile, useful human activity. It can be deeply rewarding and generate great sense of purpose. So, the chief economist of the Bank of England said the future could be high tech and high touch economy. So care is a service worth investing in it. It's a form of wealth creation. And we could in fact envisage a future in which care, both for relationships and people, but also a care ethic embedded in how we bring up our children applies to our environment as well, because of course, that's the other parallel crisis of care. Fundamentally, the environmental crisis is a crisis of care. So having had an industrial revolution, which enforced a work ethic with all the cultural resources of church and state to enforce that, I would suggest our challenge now is a care ethic. How do we embed that? in our children. Thank you. Madeline, thank you so much. This is where there's a huge round of applause that goes on in the entire giant barony hall in appreciation for, um, for what a, such a powerful presentation you give. That's a good, so there's Marie, there's the minister giving us a, really like a big roar. I think you've just given us such a stimulating, powerful um, challenge and such a, a very um, disruptive, provoking um, analysis that has, gives us so much to think through. This is my opportunity now as a chair of the, of the lecture to open things up to, um, to, to speak to the audience for a moment to let you know what it is that we're doing next because it's just a little bit different from what we've done before so don't let Madeline don't let your 
head and heart that is full right now with all that Madeline's just said, don't let that go, but let me just steer us for a moment and take us forward in the next bit of the day, of the evening. Um, in lieu of questions this year, we've asked two of our University of Strathclyde colleagues to provide a response to Madeline's lecture. And, um, uh, and following this, Madeline will then be reflecting her thoughts on their response. It gives us an opportunity to have something of a conversation despite our two dimensions. And then following this, we will enjoy a vote of thanks from the Minister, Marie Todd, uh, who we're so delighted to have joined us as well. So on to our two formal responses then. Let me introduce two, um, uh, both my esteemed colleagues to you just now, and uh, one will then follow on to the next without my further interference. The first is uh, Dr. Graham Connolly. So he is an honorary senior research fellow in Celsius, which is the Center for Excellence for Children's Care and Protection. He will be known to many of you in the field of, um, of, of children's care and protection in Scotland, certainly. Um, Graham is a chartered psychologist, as well as being that honorary senior fellow, a research fellow. And um, prior to his retirement, which we were all very sad about, he held various academic appointments at the university over his 26 years here. And his research interests relate to the education and the well-being of care experienced children, young people and adults. Um, but he's also a non-executive director at Kibble Education and Care Centre and a trustee of the MCR Pathways School-Based Mentoring Program. And he is also the editor of the Scottish Journal of Residential Child Care, um, where you will be able to get um, to read Madeline's uh, presentation later on this year. And our second responder, Equally as beloved, I think, we'll, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Lo Dr. Laura Steckley. So uh, Laura's a senior lecturer at Strathclyde in social work and social policy and with Celsius. And her professional childcare background is in direct practice and in management and training in residential care and treatment for adolescents in the US and in Scotland. And um, Laura leads the MSc in advanced residential childcare and is a vice convener of the university's research ethics committee. And her teaching and research primarily focuses on residential childcare, and in particular, um, the developmentally enhancing and relationship-based practices and related complexities. So I'm going to ask Graham and then Laura to give uh, your responses, please. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much, Madeline, for such a thought-provoking and enjoyable lecture. You've challenged us to think about that small four letter word care in so many different ways. Your book, Labours of Love, The Crisis of Care, makes rather disturbing reading, but it also probably shows us what we need to do to value care better. The book is thoroughly researched and beautifully written. Over four years, you listened, you shadowed, and you volunteered. My own professional and voluntary life, as Jennifer has outlined, has been intimately connected with the care experience of children and young people. So I homed in easily on the questions you've raised, but I've also got a very personal take on your observations. My 98-year-old mother was in hospital when the pandemic struck last year. She couldn't return to her sheltered flat and is now in a nursing home. Like so many families, We've experienced frustration and guilt, caught in the liminal space care homes currently inhabit between avoiding residents' deaths at all costs and actively supporting real people to live decent, meaningful lives. We scrabble between having no control and trying to claw back bits of control. Madeline, as you did, I'm going to name check your earlier book, which I loved, Love of Country, A Hebridean Journey, not just because you applied the same journalistic values to that research, the interconnections with literature, particularly poetry, the intelligent voices of the people you talk to in your journey and the revealing glimpses of the personal, but also because of some of other observations which resonated with me. For example, you point out that the island Iona's history can be easily misunderstood you say that writers have homed in on the island's remoteness. And yet, as you say in the book, at several times in its history, the island has been very well connected. That loss of awareness of connectedness seems to me to be an apt metaphor for how care has become marginalized. In Labours of Love, 
you present several forms of evidence for that which you've outlined tonight. The way in which unpaid care is taken for granted. Your observation that capitalism was built on ignoring and marginalizing the care work of women. The spread of consumerism through public services, the valuing of paperwork and systems over relationships, captured perfectly in the words of a home care worker who told you, the work is both closely supervised and yet lonely. Endemic low pay. Finally, what you call obfuscating language, words bankrupted of meaning, such as delivery Amazon style of services and glossy brochures, which drop the word care rather carelessly into every other paragraph. As you say in the foreword to the book, because of the current pandemic, care has suddenly taken center stage and you described that for us uh, very well tonight. I like to think that that's one of the most positive things to come out of the present crisis. So I wanted to mention some things which your book and lecture have helped me to think more deeply about. The connecting word, of course, in the titles of the two books is love. When the first minister commissioned the independent care review in 2016, she made a commitment that Scotland would come together and love its most vulnerable children and give them the childhood they deserve. As in your own research journey, the Care Review said the most important task of caring is to listen. And it heard the voices of more than five and a half thousand people involved in the care system in Scotland. More than half of these care experienced themselves. I can't possibly do justice to the review in this short time, but I want to briefly highlight for you just a few things. The fact that people with care experience themselves drove the review, including the chair. The emphasis in its findings on providing adequate support for families to stay together and on keeping siblings together in care. Actively helping children in care to develop meaningful relationships with caregivers and the wider community. We may have been better in Scotland at keeping the values of the market at bay in the children's sector though not in the adult care sector. There's legislative protection in Scotland against privatization of children's services, but austerity, of course, as you outlined, has impacted universal provision. On the positive side, there's still widespread support in Scotland for universal no fees for undergraduate study. The nursing and midwifery bursary has been retained in Scotland. A substantial care experience bursary has been provided and its initial age cap of 25 was removed and there's a summer vacation grant. The journalist and care experience campaigner, Kenneth Murray has pointed out how articulate people with care experience have skillfully harnessed the media to speak publicly. He asked recently, how much might have changed sooner if people had a platform for their voice much earlier in our history? There's strong and effective support for the advocacy of human rights in the children's sector, which has led to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and Corporation Bill, currently at stage three in the parliamentary process. Most of us sadly have missed out in the past year on regular dental health screening and routine treatment. A very high proportion of care experienced adults have poor dental health, including high rates of childhood extractions. Some rather neat big data research by partners, including Celsius, led by Glasgow University's Dental School, and research and campaigning work by Who Care Scotland highlighted the inequalities. The upper age for free treatment for adults with care experience has been raised to 25. But poor dental health, effectively caused by the failure of the state to provide adequate care in childhood, has lifelong consequences. And many who are older have found that they can't afford the cost of expensive treatment. Lastly, I think it's relevant to highlight the positive contribution of this university's two research and policy centres devoted to children's care and protection and justice, Celsus and CYCJ, 
Their work has been possible because of continuing support of our principal and senior officers and ministers and civil servants who have demonstrated the belief that children in adversity have the right to have the things they care about respectfully researched. Thank you again, Madeline, for your lecture. Now I'm going to hand over to Laura for the second response. Thanks, Graham. Um, thank you, Madeline. I too really very much enjoyed your book and your um, lecture. And I, I would add um, to, to what Graham has already said about your book, an, another dimension of it that I really enjoyed was the presence or gift of, as you mentioned earlier, of, of yourself very strongly through the book and your own experiences of giving and receiving care. I just wanted to mention that before I kind of shift into um, a, a bit of a focused response. At the beginning, you talked about care as being both um, ethical and practical. And by the end, I think you were also speaking about care as political and, and that was kind of where I wanted to go with my response and maybe as a springboard to your discussion um, that follows or your response that follows. Um, John Tronto, whom you draw on in that gorgeous tapestry of thinkers, researchers, and practitioners of care in your book, um, she highlighted in 2013 what she then called um, democratic and care deficits, and she argued that they were two sides of the same coin. Um, she even went so far as to say that nothing will get better until societies figure out how to put responsibilities for caring at the center of their democratic political agendas. Now, since, since then, we've seen those trends escalate to what you rightly call a care crisis. And I think it's also arguable that we are witnessing a democratic crisis as well, especially with the events of the last several weeks in my home country of the United States. Um, anyway, her, her assertions that we have misunderstood politics as if it were part of the world of economics rather than the other way around, um, and that we need to rethink the relationship of the market to the democratic state. Those seem to chime with your arguments about the eclipsing way an economic discourse around care um, is unproductive. Um, I was also struck by the degree to which some of the people that you interviewed in your book did really seem to have their citizenship and capacity to participate in democratic society significantly constricted by the way care is currently conceived and organized. You talked about a structural and systemic way that care is devalued um, and how their, si their experiences are silenced. And I think this is a, I don't know, I'm, I wonder about how this fits into a wider conceptualization as care, um, as being intimately connected with democracy. I also wonder at the way that care is so devalued, um, what, how that has affected the very fabric of our social relations and some of the ways in which we see that kind of happening with COVID, the rise of the far right, um, that sort of thing. If we add the climate crisis to the mix, um, it seems that we might be approaching some sort of pivotal moment where you mentioned a turning point earlier, where it's no longer viable to keep care related concerns in the shadows and the margins, especially if we start to accept care as a broader species of activity beyond like health and social care, to include all of the ways that the labor of care is central to human life including like parcel delivery, as you mentioned earlier in your discussion, but also the care of the planet. Um, and just over a year ago, David, the late David Graeber now um, wrote of the beginnings of a global revolt of what he termed the caring classes, pointing out that our most dramatic struggles of labor activity of recent years has involved cleaners, teachers, nursing home workers, junior doctors, and university workers. And so I just kind of wanted to, to ask about your thoughts about this. Tronto, she argues for what she calls caring with, 
And she defines this as a phase of caring which requires that caring needs and the way in which those needs are met, how they need to be consistent with our democratic commit commitments to justice, equality, and fairness, or freedom, justice, equality, and freedom for all people in an inclusive society. And so um, I just wondered your thoughts about that, just in terms of, of this potential turning point. Thank you very much to both Graham and Laura for such rich and stimulating responses. Um, there's, there's a very wide range of, of subjects raised here and, and I can't possibly uh, do them all justice. So I'm sorry about that. I'm, I suspect we could have continued this conversation uh, long into this evening if I was in Glasgow now and wouldn't I love to be, but there we go. Um, I'm glad Graham mentioned his 90 year old, 98 year old mother um, because I think bringing this kind of personal experience, as Laura says, it's it's a form of gift of self. And I think it comes more easily uh, to, to a lot of women. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, men can join a conversation. I, I, I'm sure lots of men do, but it, it, it's, it's to be welcomed. I think we're dismantling uh, a, a, a sort of um, uh, boundary, really, a border between the personal uh, and the public. Um, and care was, was always tightly within the personal and therefore people felt it wasn't appropriate to bring it in. Um, but that's why I brought my own personal experiences uh, into the book um, because I, I feel it's actually at that level of sort of universality whereby we all recognize we're in the same boat that we offer care we struggle sometimes to offer care. We would like to offer more care. Like Graham, this pandemic experience has been uh, an excruciating experience of not being able to look after my mother and not being able to provide her with more care. Um, so uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm very um, appreciative of Graham on that and um, very much appreciate uh, the, the descriptions that he was giving about uh, the efforts uh, of um, children in care uh, in Scotland and that fascinating inquiry, which I'm um, uh, familiar with. Uh, and Laura raises a, a raft of really interesting points, which I hope the audience will take away with them and think uh, deeply about. Care is used to reflect power structures. And I think Tronto's insights on that are really, really helpful. You know, I live in London where a large proportion of the care workforce in its lowest, lowest paid is, um, is, is BAME, um, black ethnic minority. Um, and uh, the, the, the low pay and the way in which um, they have uh, often not been unionized is reflect, reflecting um, a, 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 a deep structural imbalance around power. Care has a fascinating relationship with power and we don't have time to get into it tonight, but of course power is in all sorts of care relationships in all sorts of ways. And, and we didn't talk this evening about the abuse of care, which is a, 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 yeah, a terrible reality. And all care has to be organized and, in, and, and, and thought about in ways that reduce that possibility for abuse. Um, and I would argue that we've implemented an audit culture, which is not actually very effective at reducing abuse. What reduces abuse is strong team working, strong cultures of care. No individual cares on their own. They're always caring in, uh, in uh, supported by others who care for them. So it's this reciprocality of care constantly needs to be emphasized. Um, my care of others is only possible because of the way others are caring for me. Uh, I'd, I'd like to end on just uh, one point briefly, um, unfortunately not time to get into it further, um, just about uh, pedagogy and the, and the model of pedagogy that I came across in Denmark and how inspiring it was. Because there was a system of education uh, where children did, a, um, students did a three year degree, which was about how you nurture human potential in another human being. And that pedagogy degree might mean that they ended up in a kindergarten or they might end up in a care home or indeed they might end up caring for children uh, in care. The same principles applied. 
develop their own humanity so that they could develop others' humanity. And the way they did that was through creativity. So I thought I'd have landed up in an art school. I was like, hang on, why is this place full of props for the theater and artworks? And they said, that's how we develop our own understanding of who we are through the, the songs we sing, the plays we put on, the paintings, the sculpture. And that's why I was so fascinated by the relationship between care and creativity uh, and uh, drew on that extensively in my book. Uh, and I think it's that kind of inspirational um, perspective uh, about care as a profoundly creative act akin to poetry and music and song and dance and indeed needing to uh, include all of those uh, in, in its life enhancing, life enriching uh, capacities. Uh, and uh, one final word, Einstein said, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. And I would add, but it can be changed if we change our thinking. So if you've understood that, terrific. Thank you so much. Lovely, thank you very much, Madeline. Yet again, we've got another round of very loud applause that I hope you're hearing and imagining. Yeah, thank you, Nasser Jim is gonna be giving us the, the clapping. Thank you, Madeline, thank you so much. Um, and, that, and now to, to close off this evening, we have Minister Marie Todd, who's the Minister for Children and Young People, known to many of, of you in the audience just now, um, who has come to um, our Zoom panel room to join us. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Minister, someone who's so clearly committed to children and young people, both um, in personal and professional ways, which you've demonstrated from your tablet gate through to the very chat we had today before the, the start of the presentation. So we're grateful to you for giving the vote of thanks this evening. Over to you, Minister. Oh, thank you so much. What an absolute pleasure it is to be with you this evening. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Davidson and distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to thank Madeline Bunting for this year's Cobrandon Lecture. With my own Hebridean connections, I wish we had another hour to chat about the Hebrides. Because for me, the leap from the Hebrides to care is not such a big leap at all. Um, Island life is defined by empathy. To survive life on an island, you have to be attuned to what's happening with your neighbors. It's a survival thing. And of course, in the Gallic culture, we talk um, at least as often about who are your people, as we do ask the question, where are you from? It's who are you from rather where, than where are you from? So I can see absolutely clearly why your journey to the Hebrides would have inspired you to look more closely at care. We're very grateful for the generous way in which you've shared the central arguments in Labour of Love and the Crisis of Care. And your lecture this evening has been challenging. You've highlighted the need for all of us to form a deeper understanding of care and a richer appreciation of the skills and the knowledge involved. And you've emphasized the centrality of empathy and trust and, and just as importantly, the need for our public institutions, especially in the light of the pandemic, to look afresh at the value that we place in care. Here in Scotland, as you've heard, we are absolutely determined, committed and resolute that we will put love at the very heart of care for our children. You certainly, though, provoked our curiosity into care as you set out to do. And I laughed at your description of care. I mean, it really resonated with me, just a couple of the words you chose as a mum of three. You mentioned care being both exhausting and profoundly meaningful. Um, I also loved the way that you talked about touch and I think that each and every one of us have touched 
upon the sense at the moment, at this very moment in time, while we all have to stay apart, how we are all yearning for touch more than ever before. And I think that is an uncomfortable thing for us to consider, but it's a vitally important one. I'm very happy to join you in making the word delivery redundant. Um, care is anything but passive. It is a dynamic relationship. And I am probably not the only woman in the room who will have railed at the substitution of the word delivery for birth, um, literally giving the mother a passive role in the significant event in their family's life. And of course, handing the starring role to a doctor. Well, what can I say? During um, this lecture, I'm a politician, I'm afraid I cannot stay off Twitter. So slap bang in the middle of this um, lecture, one of our wonderful early learning and childcare practitioners tweeted me, we're having a bit of a day celebrating going back to early learning and childcare. And we have a little campaign going about thumbs up for early years. And she tweeted me this quote from Gordon Neufield. We were never meant to care for children whose heart we do not have. And I just thought that was so profoundly perfect for the lecture that you gave us tonight that I felt it was worth admitting that I had been tweeting. So all of your audience this evening from many professions will be grateful to you for the insights that you have presented. Your insights will have also inform how the Scottish Government responds to Derek Feely's independent review of adult social care. You've heard how um, we're, you know, we're listening to you at a very pivotal point in Scotland. Pivotal not just because of the Feely review, I think Graham mentioned the revolution in children's rights that we have happening with the incorporation of UNCRC. I am personally determined to ensure that every child and adult in Scotland receives the care and the support that they need to live full and active and flourishing lives. The Scottish Government will work in coming years with local authorities and health and social care and education sectors to promote a rights-based approach to well-being and independent living. On the 5th of February this year, we celebrated the first anniversary of the Promise. And as you know, the Promise came out of the Independent Review of Care, which was one of the most substantial, ambitious and necessary reviews in the history of the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Government is fully committed to delivering the recommendations set out within the Promise. The Promise demands change right across the system in Scotland that will involve practical change at every level, but more fundamentally, it will require a transformation in the culture of care. Now that will take time, but the process of change started immediately and it is continuing apace. It actually began as the review went on. Just this month, the government launched the Promise Partnership Fund, an investment of four million pounds from the Scottish government administered by the Cora Fund Foundation. The fund will help support early intervention and prevention work across Scotland, and it will help organisations create capacity, adapt approaches, work towards cultural shifts and collaboration to improve holistic family support. We aim to create for the new normal for sector-wide collaboration, which listens to families when they speak, supporting them when they need it, when they need it, where they need it, and for as long as they need it. It's about making a difference to how we work with care experienced children, young families, young people and families, and most importantly, as you've heard, 
these changes must reflect what matters most to them as they lay out in the promise. We are, of course, mindful for the need for immediate support during the pandemic and lockdown. And that includes exploring what direct actions can be taken to mitigate the potential risk to vulnerable care leavers as a result of isolation and lockdown. We aim to develop and implement proposals within the next two to three months. I would also add that this month, regulations were passed in the Scottish Parliament, which allow siblings to have a greater input into children's hearings. These bring an opportunity for brothers and sisters to attend and to take a full part in the matters being considered that concern them. This is very much meeting the promised findings and it will add to protecting family relationships and ensuring that contacts maintained. So to conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Principal Sir Jim MacDonald for his introduction and Professor Jennifer Davidson, who has chaired tonight's slightly different lecture with such skill. And I really appreciated the contribution of Dr. Graham Connolly and Dr. Laura Steckley. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I want to convey my thanks for the continuing support that the School of Social Work and Social Policy and the wider university gives this lecture series. I'm so pleased to hear that the University of Strathclyde's Scottish Journal of Residential Childcare, which has a growing international audience, is producing an edition that will contain a published version of tonight's lecture. I want to thank Mr. Raymond Taylor from the University for organising tonight's lecture and for also for our appreciation for the meticulous work of Peg Rourke and Fiona Lynn. Thank you also to Alan McLeave for ensuring that the proceedings have run so smoothly this evening. And finally, I want to convey my appreciation to all of you who have come here to hear the Kilbrandon Lecture, particular, particularly those of you who are directly involved in the hearing system as panel members, reporters, social workers and teachers. The valuable work of children's panel members, children's reporters, social workers, teachers, and other childcare professionals has since the inception of the children's hearing system made an enormous difference to the lives of thousands of children and their families. Scotland's children's hearing system is an institution which reflects our distinctive Scottish values and culture. And it, it is an important means of ensuring that Kilbrandon's vision of an effective and integrated justice and welfare system for children and young people is passed on to future generations, updated and strengthened and refined to meet our future needs. Madeline, you encouraged us to be ambitious, braver, and hopeful, we are immensely grateful for you, to you for the unique perspective that you have brought to the 18th Kilbrandon Lecture. And I'm going to hand back now to Professor Jennifer Davidson, who will conclude tonight's proceedings. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much, Minister. That was just such a great, thank you for sharing your Hebridean reflections on on care and on what Madeline's shared as well. It's lovely for us to be thinking that way. Um, so this is my opportunity to just bring us to a close um, this very unusual Kilbrandon lecture. Unusual in that we're two dimensions and in separate rooms, but not unusual in the very really rigorous, stimulating um, lecture that we just heard from you, Madeline. So from me as well, thank you again. Um, there are just a couple of things I'd like to uh, share with you that are more functional. So if I could just turn uh, from, from Madeline's presentation to just to you in the audience at the moment. Um, if you have been tweeting, please would you go back to your tweets and make sure there's a hashtag Kilbrandon. 
because one of the things we're not getting now at the end of this Kilbrandon lecture is the opportunity for a bite of food or a glass of wine or a drink of juice and then a chat. And if you've ever been to the, those of you who have been to the Kilbrandon lectures know that, you know, the estates people at the university are just, you know, hovering for ages at the doors, trying to get all of us out the door, but we stick around and we talk and we think through what's been said and we um, catch up with people we haven't seen for ages. So I want to just recognize for a moment, it's a big loss for us not to have that this year. And people are feeling really isolated from not having those opportunities. And I suspect that when we get back together next time, we will be giving giant hugs to each other, recognizing, affirming the, the importance of touch, but that um, it will be so important for us to see each other again. So because we can't have that, perhaps at the moment, what we do is we go onto, onto our Twitter. And um, what we'd really like to do is to ask you to, to continue the conversation about what struck you about what, um, what we've heard tonight. What is it that you loved? What were you not sure about? What do you think needs another conversation? And would you just keep that chatter going for a little bit and we'll try and see if we can. And even tomorrow when you wake up and you go, I'm still thinking about that thing Madeline said. Um, or next week when you've bought and had the Amazon delivery at your door and you've read her book and then you have something more to say. Can we just keep that Kilbrandon, hashtag Kilbrandon stream going so that we can enjoy and sort of savor it because it feels far too short a time to have been given such a it's like we've just been fed this amazing feast Madeline and now you're making us we're all having to get up and leave the house without even sitting back and sort of reclining over a delicious meal so it's it's an, an unusual way of doing this so let's try and keep it going on on um on Twitter and Madeline we will really enjoy welcoming you to Glasgow when you are next in Glasgow and we have already we've already got that planned so that will that will happen and so and um, uh, the last thing to say that is so appropriate to this evening tonight is that this is the eve, the um, eve of Care Day tomorrow, and uh, and so I would like to wish everyone a very happy and meaningful, and now that much more of a reflective space that you've given us, Madeline, to be able to um, to make our Care Day tomorrow together all that much more meaningful. So thank you, because that was perfect timing. And Ronald may, um, Raymond, you may not have thought about it to, uh, to be quite so well-timed, but it works beautifully for us with Care Day, so thank you. And so it leaves me just to say thank you to our panel, of course, especially to Madeline, to, minister, to the minister for taking time with us, to, to the principal and others, as we've heard the thanks. But thank you to you for joining us. And um, I wish you well, and can we just remind you that you are amongst supportive folk. This is a community of people who come regularly, so if you're, if you're a regular, we miss you, and if you've just begun to come to the Kilbrandon Lectures, then we are looking forward to meeting you in person. Keep safe and well, and I hope that our 19th Kilbrandon Lecture, we will be attending together and not in our slippers. I wish you a lovely evening, and thank you again, Madeline. Good night. <laughs>